So uh, my message today is called Love Experienced. We've been talking last week about love and uh, in a series of Love So Great, and we talked about love expressed. Uh, this week we're talking about love experience. I think it's perfect for this weekend, um, and we'll tie it to a message from the Word. And we're going to go to Genesis in a few minutes, so if you want to go ahead. Well, last week we, we, we kind of like began in, in Genesis, and then we turned back to Genesis and looking at that creation story about how God first expressed his love towards us and made us in his image. So we'll, uh, we'll touch on that just briefly, but uh, this, you got to give me a little bit of, this is, a, is, this is PG-13 joke coming out here, okay? So just making sure the kids were dismissed. And uh, so just go ahead and forgive your pastor in advance, all right, as I share this Valentine's joke, okay? And I'm going to give you a little, little preamble warning. It, it's a joke. Everybody say it's a joke to the person beside you. It's a joke, okay? All right, go ahead, Andy, put the slide up. Uh, a store just opened up in Toronto. It's called the Husband's Store. When women go in to choose a husband and they had a sale on, husbands were free. Now, the sign inside the store said, you may only visit this store once. There are six floors to choose from. You may choose any item from any particular floor, or you may go up to the next floor, but you cannot go back to the floor you were at before. You can only go down to exit the building. There was a big rule there. All right, so a woman goes into the store and finds the first floor sign reading this. Floor one, these men have jobs. She goes up to the second floor. Second floor sign reads, floor two, these men have jobs and love kids. She continues on. Third floor sign reads, floor three, these men have jobs, love kids, and are extremely good looking. Extremely good looking. Wow, she thinks, but feels compelled to keep going up. She goes to the fourth floor and the sign reads, floor four, these men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead gorgeous, and love helping with housework. She goes, oh, mercy me, she exclaims. I can hardly stand it. Still, she goes to the fifth floor, and the sign reads, floor five. These men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead gorgeous, help with housework, and have a strong romantic streak. Woo, she says. She's tempted to stay, but she goes to the sixth floor, and the sign reads, floor number six. You are visitor 71,456 to this floor. There are no men on this floor. This floor exists solely to prove that women are impossible to please. <laughs> Thank you for shopping at the husband store. <laughs> to avoid gender bias, the owner builds a store across the street, and he opens a wife store just there. And the first floor says this, these wives love sex. The second floor says, these wives love sex and love to cook. The third floor all the way to the sixth floor have never been visited. All right. Were you ready for the word? And everybody says, Come move it along, Pastor, move it along. <laughs> so as I mentioned, we're talking about a love so great in this February series. We're kind of probably, it'll bleed into March together because there's so much about the love of God. We're trying to describe something that the Bible says is indescribable, how great his love for us. We worship this morning singing a song about his great love for us. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, God's love is something not just to think about or to, to, to know about, but to actually experience. This is the intention of the love of God, that it's experiential. To be fully understood, you have to experience. Real love needs to be experienced. We have to open our hearts to him as our father, who loves us, who lavished his love upon us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many people know that is true love? God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, and it defines what love really is. Love is so much more greater than we can imagine, that we think. It's agape love. 
which is God kind of love, which is beyond the, the earthly filial love, friendship, eros love, romantic love, and all the types of love that mankind, well, I love pizza and I love my wife. Like, really? Is that the same kind of love? How many people know the English language is confusing at times? It doesn't always describe things well. But God says there's a greater love than we can feel, that we can understand, that we can experience, and that's his love. The most important revelation in a person's life is to come to the heart knowledge of our beloved identity in God. He made us, we talked about last week. He made us for him last week. And speaking of identity, I would like to tread thoughtfully here as I just begin to look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. Last week when we pitched our tent at Genesis 1 26 where we say God made me from him. If you weren't here last week, you really do need to hear that message. I think it's very important to understand how God first expressed his love towards us because God made us from him. The second thought we shared last week was that we are a spirit. I am a spirit. I have a soul and I live in a body. That's how God expressed his love in his creation of us, that we are truly spirit people. Our bodies kind of are supposed to follow our spirit who is our real identity. We have a soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, where we experience life by. But this week, we're going to look at the next verse. And if you have your Bible, the Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, go ahead, find that in your Bible. Similar to what we read earlier, but a little bit more detail here, which fits with my joke earlier. If you're wondering why I pulled that joke out of the air, no, no, no. It fits with Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. How many people believe that's the word of the Lord? How many people believe that's exactly the way it is? Male and female. There's no other option, folks. This is how God created us. So the point that I want to make right off the top here, which is point number three kind of in this series, is that God made me like him. Everybody say, God made me like him. God made me like him. We are like him. There are similarities. There are, there are, we, we look like. You, you ever heard the, the saying, oh, that kid looks like the spitting image of his dad? You ever heard that saying before, spitting image? You know what that actually comes from? The original is that that boy has the spirit and image of his father. And so it got condensed into slang, spitting image. But it's spirit and image. You are the spitting image of the father in heaven. Isn't that a good thing? Your spirit and image of the father. Being male, here, being male is a matter of birth. Being a man is a matter of age. Being a gentleman is a matter of choice. And all the women said, thanks, honey. <laughs> Being female is a matter of birth. Being a woman is a matter of age. Being a lady is a matter of choice. And all the men said, oh, you guys, that was really pathetic. You had all that warming. The women did way better than us. Oh, I could, you can tell why the better half or is always, yeah, anyways, we're, we'll move it on. God made me like him. I'm sharing this with you because it's about God's great love, how he created us, how he made us. In this creation narrative, we see that he made a replica of himself. God made Adam in his image and in his likeness. Remember, there's no sin in the world at this point. Could you imagine that? Placed on the planet, in all of its beauty and wonder, the creative beauty that God had made, he places man there, and there is zero sin. No heartache, no heartbreak, no lying, no fear, no anxiety. How many people know, wow, wouldn't that have been amazing? Adam and Eve, you blew it. It was perfect. It's amazing. Adam looks like God, thinks like God, talks with God, walks with God all the time. Adam had not sinned yet. He had never even had, get a load of this, an impure thought. God made someone after his image according to his likeness. But Adam has a desire. He has a desire. Let me draw your attention to verse 20 of that same chapter. Verse 20, and it begins by saying, And man gave names to all the livestock, all the animals, to the birds of the air, to every animal of the field, but for Adam. Everybody say, but for Adam. But for Adam. 
but for Adam, there was not found a helper that was a comparable or comparable companion for him. Why is this here? Why is this reference actually placed in our scripture? Because it says Adam was looking for something. Adam was looking for someone comparable to him. He was looking for a companion. And that's been placed into all of our lives. Is to, it's not good for man to be alone. God has placed a desire in all of us to look for companionship. Someone he could share his life with. This is Valentine's weekend. I think this is an appropriate message for love this weekend. Someone to be your Valentine. It's placed in us, every desire. It's like this, and I'm going to add some holy imagination, so bear with me and say, hey, that, is that in the Bible? I said holy imagine adding to the story. So I think a conversation may have happened like this in the garden. It may have happened. All right, just it, maybe. Adam goes to God, just says, I'm lonely. The garden is wonderful and all, God. It's amazing. The mountains, the oceans, everything's incredible, but, but I feel alone. I feel lonely. I talk to you, but there's something missing. I, I'm sorry, God, but I, I still have a longing. I'm not sure what it actually is. I desire to share my life, but none of these animals are a comparable to me. God may have said, may have said something like this in reply. Okay, everybody just holy imagination. Thinking caps, yes, now imagination caps. This God may have said, okay, I made all of this wonderful thing for you, uh, but I have a task for you, Adam. Would you go ahead and name all the animals? And that's your first task. And could you do this for me? And while you're at it, could you check the animals out to see if any of them you kind of like? Everybody understand that was kind of the story here. Something like that anyway. So how many people, you give a little bit of grace on this holy imagination. Why would it say there was not found Anyone, if he wasn't looking, if he wasn't searching, if, if, how many people know, it's a strange thing to say in there, if he wasn't looking for something. He's looking. So he says to the hippo, oh my goodness, I like you, but, oh, uh, you eat too much food. No, thank you. He moves on to the kangaroo and goes, I can't keep up with you. And he moves along. He sees the goose and he says something like, no thanks, with all that honking, you'd probably move to Ottawa. So he just <laughs> leaves. That doesn't work for him either. And he says the tiger, oh, beautiful, nice warm coat, but have you seen those teeth? No thanks. Now, he sees the cow, and if you remember last week's message, he goes, cows make ice cream. He pauses, but soon realizes she'd be way too moody. Anyways, that's bad. We're moving along. I could tell when I was saying it, that was dumb. Okay. So he looks to the animals, and then God puts them to sleep. This is important. Guys, we're asleep half the time when God's doing miracles. True. All the women go, hey, men, Yes. He's looking for a companion. This is about love. This is how love is experienced. While he's dreaming, God does some surgery and pulls out a rib. When he wakes up, there's a new creature before him. And his first words are, whoa, man. Hence the name, woman. That, was, that joke was better than I give, give myself credit for here. That's how she got her name, by the way. Personally, I think it's the first time ever declared in creation, praise the Lord, when he sees her for the first time. Wow, I like her. I like this one God. He rubs his side and he goes, she's just like me, but better. Interesting, when God made man, he used dirt, formed it together. When he made woman, he used a bone to form her. So technically, we could call each other dirtbags and boneheads to be biblical about it, but we won't go there. My wife says, don't tell that joke. That's dumb. <laughs> but in our English Bible, the word formed is used twice, once for the man, and then formed for the woman. But in Hebrew, man was formed or squeezed together. That's what it means, formed, squeezed, while the woman was fashioned together. Big difference. How people would agree men are squishy and women are fashionable. That's basically the difference. And this is no wonder ladies look like they're always put together and the guys feel like they're always just squishy messes walking around. 
the reality is we don't know how to put ourselves together. We need woe men in our lives. God bless us. I remember when I first met Sonia, and she's kind of visiting me in my ghetto apartment, and uh, I, was, I had these really weird shoes that I thought were really cool, and they disappeared one time. I think they, they went into the big O file and out to the trash. I don't know whatever, I don't even know what you did with them, and she goes, you ain't wearing those dumb looking boots. And then she goes to my closet and she goes, man, I'm going to help you. You're a mess. And she goes, hillbilly in the garbage. Yeah, we'll keep that. Hillbilly, uh, hillbilly. And basically, two or three things are left on my shelf and everything else went else to the, to the, uh, the Salvation Army. She helped me. How people, all the men in the house go, thank God for women's abilities and skills and love for us. How did God know that a woman would meet Adam's need, that this woman would satisfy his heart's desire because he made her the bride at his side. I think it's beautiful in understanding this love so great that God makes a man just like him, but only lower, the scriptures say. And then he makes a bride just like man, but only better. Yes, that's true, only better. And there was no sin in the world at this time. Remember that. This is an amazing, perfect, ideal location. And they walk with God, and they talk with God, and they have desires like God. In the creation of man, God makes him, Adam, the first man, the one he wants to make something out of, and there is a love relationship born of themselves. How did God know? Because God has the same desire for companionship and love. You, know, you want to know what God's great desire is? It's you. Take your fingers and go like this. It's me. You might not think so, but God's great desire is you. Think about it this way. God's going to give his son something. What do you give at the end of the ages? He's going to bless his son with a great gift for the sacrifice. And what do you give someone that has everything, literally has everything? God is preparing a bride for his son. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So there's a wedding in the garden, and there's a wedding feast in the end in the book of Revelation. How many people know God loves a good wedding? He loves to celebrate marriage. Culminating with the marriage supper of the Lamb, we see God preparing his bride right now. You and I are the bride of Christ, getting ready, prepared, without spot or wrinkle, for the glorious day that we sang at the very first song today. He's coming, and it will be a glorious day, and that we'll join him and all the saints in heaven for a great victorious celebration. How people know there's a feast waiting for us. I can't imagine the spread God created the earth in six days. He prepared earth in six days. He's had 2,000 years to get heaven ready for us. How many people think it's going to be amazing? He's preparing us as the bride as he's preparing a place for us to celebrate. And because God wants to share his life with you and I, he wants you to experience his great love. You might not think of it this way, but God's desire is you and for you to experience his great love. He wants you to be his eternal valentine and marry you. He wants a, an eternal relationship with you to begin now and forever and ever. Amen. It's not love if it's forced or coerced. It's love of free will. He created mankind in the garden with free will. And how people know the free will led them down a path that creates all kinds of problems. And sometimes our choices don't always make the right, we don't always make the right choices in life. Can I tell you, the voices you listen to will be the choices that you'll walk through. What did Adam and Eve do? They listened to the lies of the serpent. So the voice they heard led them to a choice of sin. And that was a great tragedy. But here's the eternal question. Will you be in a forever relationship with God? Because that's his desire with you. And at the altar of your heart, is there a I do to be united with Christ and be a part of his great family? Because we're not pre-programmed to say I do. We have a choice. You have a choice. And you have a voice. Use your voice for love. Imagine a couple getting at the altar, and the minister says, but they're doing their vows, and then will you take, and will you take? And the guy goes, um, 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 run! 
How many people know if he's going to hesitate at the altar and there's more ums than I do's, that's not necessarily a good side. Would you agree? Is there a lot of ums in your heart or is there a great big I do in your heart to Jesus? Are you willing to say, I do, Lord, I'm yours forever? Forever and ever, amen. Which brings me to point number four. God made me to love him. Would you say that with me? God made me to love him. See, we're not just made like him. God actually made us to love him. That's how we're created. That's how we're wired. In fact, worship is a natural part of, the, of all of us who are created. I know uh, Josh joked earlier about the Rangers. People are cheering and going crazy at their Kitchener Rangers game. Fanatics town for hockey, right? And the Rangers, I don't get where the Rangers came from. I'm new to this town. I have no idea if there's a history, but, but why we would choose a New York Rangers. I have no idea. But that just, to me, is like, what was that? Whose plan was that? But nonetheless, there's a lot of cheering. You ever been to a Leafs game and they lose and everybody's still going, yeah! Worship! It's happening anywhere. Stanley Cup weekend, what's gonna, or Stanley Cup, Super Bowl weekend, guess a lot of worship's gonna be happening. A lot of cheering. How many people know we were created to worship? We were created to cheer on. We were created to be engaged with our hearts and our emotions to say, yes! This is what I want. I enjoy this. God made us to love him. He made us to love us. He loved us. And so he made us to learn how that we can enjoy that relationship by loving him. God made Adam and Eve, husband and bride, Jesus and the church, bridegroom and bride. That's a pretty intimate relationship. That's true love. Literally a marriage made in heaven and a marriage made for heaven. It's a beautiful thing. So God's great desire is to be loved by you, to be in relationship with you. Some may call that worship. That's what I'll call it. To love and be loved is really the definition of what worship is. Worship is a pathway to experience a love so great. So when I say to my wife, Sonia, I love you, there's no one on earth I'd rather be with than you. What am I doing? I'm expressing love. Sure, actually, I'm experiencing love in my expression of love to her. Because how many people know, if you are the one who are saying, I love you, you're also in that moment experience the very nature of what love is all about. Because love is placed inside of us. And in giving, we receive. Truest experience of God's love is found in worship. And in your quiet time, or you're driving down the road, and it's just you and Jesus, and tears streaming down your face. I've been there before, where it's just me connecting with, with God, and his glory fills my car. It's like, people look over at me, and that guy's having a breakdown. No, 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 I'm pulling over, and I'm just lost in his presence. There's no greater feeling. Or if I'm on a hike, come on. How many people, I know a lot of you are hikers in here, great hikers, and you're there in the glory and the majesty of the surroundings, and the birds are chirping. Oh, how many people are waiting for spring? Hallelujah, it's coming. But you're there in that moment, and your heart rises up, and there's some kind of expectation, and you're loving the moment, but also you're reflecting on the beautiful God that loves you, and you're in awe, and love fills that moment. It's a beautiful thing where you're sitting in a church service like today, and when you worship God, we're being led into his courts with praise and into his presence with thanksgiving. And we're grateful unto him. God fills the temple. God inhabits, lives with the praises of his people. Basically, when you're worshiping, whether it's in your car or on a hike or in a church service, basically you're saying, God, I love you. You made me to love you, and I'm going to love you in this moment. I'm taking every advantage. I'm not just waiting for Sunday for an hour once a week to tell you I love you. I love you. I'm here, God. My life is yours. You made me to love you. Now, let me close with these final thoughts, and I only have one closing, I promise, for sure. Some weeks I sneak in three, but I really only have well, maybe one and a half today. That's all. I want to share with you this, this thought. God is by nature a giver. For God so loved the world that, he, what did he do? He, he gave. You, you, 
You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. In the very nature of love, in the very nature to experience the love of God, it's found in the very fact that God by nature is a giver. He has given us so much. How people, we're blessed so many different ways. So God cannot receive, I'll say this, without giving. So it's a beautiful reaping and sowing of giving. The more you give, the more you receive. The more you receive, the more you give. How many people know that's worship in every format? That's why in tithing and giving, there's this, you can't outgive God. You give to God your worship, he gives you back love. He, you give to God in your tithe, he gives back love and support and all the things that we need. He meets all of us in all of our needs. It's a good thing. I don't know about you, when you were growing up, you ever, you ever play the game tag? Anybody not know what I'm talking about? Not know, okay, everybody's pretty familiar with the game tag. I love playing the tag. We used to play tag at night, which was the best because we ran into trees and killed each other half the time. And in the orchard, it was awesome because you couldn't see those apple branches. And we played tag with our cousins all the time. It was one of the great things we did on the farm. But I always loved making this rule at the very beginning. We're going to play tag is a rule that's called no touchbacks. Because how many people know when you're running, 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 you're it, and you touch somebody, and you're like, <laughs> and you can't run away because you gave all your energy. And then they turn around and touch you. Tag, you're it. How many people know no touchbacks is a good rule? But with God, in a good way, touchbacks are exactly how he works. We chase after God, and he chases after us. This is how God works. If you touch God, he touches you back right away. Now, why is this important to make a connection with God in your worship and your love to him, your quiet time, and the time where you spend in his word, wherever you spend moments with God? Why is it important to know that God wants to touch your life back? Because that's how he is. He's a giver. Because worship is touching upon a love so great. If you will simply touch him, he will touch you back. What do I mean by that? Remember the gospel story? where the woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, went to doctors, couldn't get any solutions, and she heard that Jesus was in town, and her very words, if I could just touch Jesus, if I could just touch even the hem of his garment, in other words, if I could just touch what's touching him, I don't even have to touch him, but I just have to touch what's touching him, that I would be, faith rose up in her heart, believing that just the touch towards Jesus would be enough for her life. And so in this, she touches his garment, and it says she was immediately healed. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 who touched me? In a crowd of multitudes, he asked, who touched me? The disciples are going, uh, like, everybody? They didn't understand that there was somebody who was chasing after Jesus, desperate for a miracle, desperate for a touch from him, and he knew because it said immediately virtue went out from him and she was healed. How many people know that's a great gospel story? I love it so much. One of my favorites. And this is what's amazing here, considering God's great love for us, is that if you give, you will receive. If we don't give or reach out, touch the Lord, whether in our worship, our love for him, don't expect that you'll receive anything. There's people who come to church often, and I didn't get very much out of that, and that sermon was too long, the worship service, I don't know, those songs had too many drums. Or, and people, like, they're, like, gauging, like you went to Walmart to say, man, my favorite ice cream's not there. And we become consumers instead of worshipers. So when we go and consume the goods and services of a religious house, listen to me, church, I'm not mad at you, but listen to me, if you had approached church life as like, what have you done for me lately? Oh, that message last week was great. This week, oh my gosh, that pastor, that joke. Did you hear his joke at the beginning in church? I don't care if it was PG-13. Never should have happened. And people respond all because of the, their emotions or their experience themselves. And they come to a place where they're not reaching for God. Can I ask you? that maybe if everybody came next Sunday, we'll just probably, everybody online, sign up. We've got lots of room for you. There's room in the balcony. There's all kinds of room. How many people are excited? This is full. Wow. Maybe there's not as much room as I think, but this is very good. That we all come with expectation and say, God, I'm here to worship you. No matter how I feel, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what happens in Ottawa, I'm here to worship you. 
I'm here to focus on the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to lift up the name of Jesus, to fill the house with praise unto his name. And could you imagine the corporate anointing and blessing that would come upon the entire church if all of us were hungry for a touch from God? What an idea. Let's come to church and worship God. How many people think that's a novel idea, a, a wonderful idea? Let's do it. Every time we gather, we have expectation that he's going to meet us in our praise. This is what's amazing here. If you don't expect, you won't receive the experience of his love for you. Because how many people know he wants to love you way more than you can imagine? I told you last week, we're, throughout the series, we're going to have these things called God moments. So here we're going to have a little God moment. Why don't you put your pens down, your Bibles down. I'm going to wrap up this idea today. It's not a closing. It's my God moment. In fact, would you stand with me? I think it might, might work great if we stand together. I'll just make this statement first. If you will give your love to God, because that's how he made you, he will immediately touch you back. And I, let me make this statement as well. You will never regret reaching out to the presence of God to worship him. Are you ready for that? So let's just close our eyes for a moment with expectation in our heart. If you touch God in worship, he'll touch you in worship. If you touch God in prayer, he will touch you in prayer. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens. You say, I love you, God. And God says, I love you more. You say, there's no one I'd rather be with than you, God. God says immediately, there's no one I'd rather be with than you. Because worship is experience is love. Experiencing the love of who we're married to. And I guarantee this. If you experience his love, your life will go to another level. So in your own words, your own heart, just go ahead and talk to your God right in this moment. Just tell him how much you love him. Without a song being sung. And if we can go from our imagined I love you in our heart and our thoughts just to say it out loud, whisper it even, just say it out loud, write to yourself the words, I love you, God. And you'll hear back, I'm sure, I love you more. This is our God. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this message. Thank you for meeting with us today. We thank you for the truth of your word that you made us in your image and likeness. We love you this morning. We give you praise.